Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Coronation Goldster Special, where this is your show to tell us what you think about the coronation. It's going to start at 11 a.m. tomorrow when the royals are going to arrive from Buckingham Palace, and it's going to last for two hours and end at, at 1 p.m. They get five main elements to it at Westminster Abbey, uh, where William the Conqueror was actually crowned in that abbey in 1066. And the sections are called the recognition, the oath, and that is when the holy oil uh, is anointed, the anointing, the investiture, and the crowning, the enthronement, and the homage, which has caused such controversy uh, over the past few days, as well as the queen consort's coronation, which has caused some discussion over the past few years. Um, as I said, this is your show, and we're gonna, I'm going to open up the gallery in just a moment to see who wants to speak. Put up a yellow hand. We have questions from some of you. Thank you very much. And my very special privilege today is that my co-host Lucinda is with me. Hello, Lucinda. Hello. Hello. And do remember as well, you can also put your questions in the chat. If you don't want to speak, you can type them into the chat and we will answer them that way as well. Um, this is very exciting, isn't it? Look at us both outside Buckingham Palace. Really. Thank you, Denise, for the comment, by the way, about the background suiting us. Um, yeah, I think this, you know, this is really our spiritual home, isn't it, Humphrey? I think I know. Do you think so? I, I Actually, know. no. I remember I the, 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 the Jubilee and the Olympic celebrations there, and I cycled past there many times. And during the lead up to the funeral, Stephanie, our wonderful Stephanie, was there laying flowers for her auntie on behalf of her auntie, I think. Uh, it was, uh, we have, we're going to start with a question because the questions actually reflect the discussion that, that we want to have. And Annie, if you are here, Annie, I'm going to open up right now to see if you are here in gallery, if you are here, Annie, put up a hand or just shout. But Annie asks, do you think Camilla will make a good queen? In my eyes, she has come a long way to winning the hearts of the British public. But is she there yet? And do you think she should have the title of queen? Lucinda, what do you think? I, I think she should, yes. I, I mean, this is, you know, throughout history, when a, a king has married a queen consort, they've always had the title of queen. I think it would be extremely controversial if she didn't. Um, I think that when the marriage, the first marriage of, of the almost King Charles broke down, of course, it was a very different world then as well. And I don't think that Camilla can be blamed for evermore for falling in love with someone who was married to someone else. Who, In fact, they were already in love before he married Diana. We have to remember that she wasn't allowed to marry Prince Charles. Um, he and Camilla were in a relationship a long time before he met Princess Diana, but the protocol people wouldn't allow her to marry Charles. So actually, it's a very, very long story. Um, I agree. I think she's come a long way to winning the hearts. I think she was extremely canny when she um, first, you know, when, when it was first announced that she and Charles were going to get married and there was such a public outcry. She did the absolute opposite of what Meghan and Harry had done recently. She just kept them. And I've found it really fascinating because when I was writing my book on Princess Louise, when I was writing my book on, on the Queen, I've looked a lot at royal history. And I think that Camilla did a very intelligent thing by just seeming to not care. She possibly did, but seeming to not care about public opinion and just keeping her mouth shut. And just perhaps she thought, well, I've got the man that I, I love and I want to be with him and everything else can just be forgotten. But she's done it in such a way that people have kind of almost got fed up with baiting her, which is maybe the best way to deal with it. I don't know. Yeah, but you, you, you talk about the protocol, which is changing, because, of course, uh, Charles, the king, was not allowed to marry her uh, mm -hmm. because uh, she was already married and because uh, he had to marry, apparently, a virgin. And this was only back in the 1980s. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Edward and, and Wallace Simpson when that happened, he had to abdicate before his coronation and went into exile yes. uh, because he wasn't allowed to marry a divorced American. Uh, encapsulate for us, Lucinda, how this protocol is changing and what else might change. Well, as far as I understand it, actually, they were in love before either of them got married. 
but he wasn't allowed to marry her therefore she got married he wasn't allowed to marry her according to the rumors because it was known that she wasn't a virgin and he had to marry a virgin um whether that's true or not of course it's hard to know but that was what the rumor was at the time so she then went and married somebody else because he got married had children he then married diana and had children i actually think it's it's good that things have changed i mean it's extraordinary how much things have changed in recent years um when prince george was born of course they changed the protocol beforehand to make sure that if kate gave birth to a daughter then finally you know in the 21st century suddenly you know gosh a, a female child could inherit before a male child i mean i cannot believe it took us to the 21st century to get that law changed it's absolutely mad but there has been a lot that's changed even things like with the death of princess diana when the queen wasn't allowed to show any emotion and that backfired and suddenly all the protocol people had to say oh you 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 can smile now you can actually show your personality because the public don't like you because you haven't shown any emotion so the royal family are very much bound by laws when I say laws, I don't mean legal, I mean you know, the, the rules of behaviour. Yes. And we've seen that all change a huge amount to the point now that we've got kind of Harry and Meghan having TV shows and, you know, it's always, it's gone so far in the opposite direction. So it's, it's interesting, but society has changed. I mean, if you look at Britain in the 1980s, nobody seemed that bothered about the fact that the heir to the throne had to marry a virgin when he was, you know, of an age where how many women yes. are still going to be virgins? Now that would be archaic in the extreme and it's not actually that long ago that this changed so no we, we've had to come a long way it was still in the dark ages yes that's it and uh, that uh, being a being a presenter of the goals to show i of course remain neutral on this issue as to whether she should be queen and and, and but the polls basically say that there's still work to be done this is the yes. the various polls is that there's still work to be done but she is going to become queen uh, tomorrow in uh, uh, with that fully fledged title um thank you for that annie manny asks is this the most romantic royal story ever? I think this is definitely one for you, Lucinda. Charles and Camilla's love story has been filled with drama, but overall we are now here watching them become king and queen. Lucinda, it is one for you, to your knowledge of the royals. Has there been anything close to this love story? I would actually say that the um, Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip was quite a romantic love story. I mean, she met him for the first time when she was 13, and had a kind of huge crush on him but just never dissipated um they they married you know and and had an incredibly long successful marriage um you know what happened in and outside that marriage of course we don't know that much about but what a partnership and i think one of the saddest images of the pandemic um for me one of them there were many many sad images but was her sitting wearing a mask on her own at her husband's funeral after all those decades of marriage and it just felt so awful. It kind of encapsulated all those people who'd had loved ones die, who couldn't be hugged at their funerals. And to see the queen sitting there in a mask um, was just really poignant, I think, after all those years of marriage. So I would say that that's a very romantic story. I think um, it, 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 it is a romantic story, but I think in that age there was, uh, you know, there was definitely a love affair and a, an attraction and they had great fun together. And yeah. then, but it, it appears to me that that is where duty of holding that whole institution together uh, superseded affairs of the heart. Whereas in Charles's, King Charles's situation, that possibly reversed? Yes, well, I mean, Charles had to, as we've talked about earlier, had to go through with duty as well. But ultimately, somebody that he, well, he and she fell in love when they were very young, are able to get married. I think that that is rather, rather beautiful. I'm sure there are many further back that I don't know about in kind of medieval times, because, you know, my knowledge of history does kind of begin with the 18th century. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit hazy further on. But I do think it's a very romantic story. I mean, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert was fairly romantic at the beginning, but I think it became a... You know, what about Henry VIII? He had uh, six wives, didn't he? Yeah, well, lovely. Well, those must have been romantic. Yeah. Is bored with them and chops the heads off. Yeah, it's really romantic, Humphrey. It's in a kind of Game of Thrones style romance. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's that's absolutely. If any, if anybody's got any ideas or thoughts of a more romantic love story than the one of Charles and Camilla, put it in the chat, and we will discuss it. <laughs> or anything else that you've got on the coronation, we're going to get to the nuts and bolts of the of the ceremony. Uh, itself. But Rachel has an interesting one here. It's 2023. 
and we live in a very different world to any monarch that has come before. What kind of reign do you think we will have with Charles and Camilla? And what are the biggest obstacles you can see them having? The biggest obstacles, I like that. Uh I don't know. Do you want to answer this at all, Humphrey, or shall I go straight in with this? Well, you go straight in because you're so good. And then I'll come in afterwards and contradict you. How's that? <laughs> that sounds perfect. Um, I think I think it is going to be difficult. I think that many people, um, I've, I've, I've met a lot of people who said, I'm not a royalist, but I really like the Queen. And I did wonder when the Queen died, how much that would change. Um, there are a lot of people who are fed up with the idea of the coronation. And I was walking through London last night and... I was quite surprised there wasn't anything like as much decorations in the area of areas of London I was walking through as I expected. There were some, but I think with the Jubilees and the Queen's birthday, there seems to be more. However, I'm, I'm not there right now and I haven't, I haven't walked out um, this evening and seen. But then other people are telling me that they're you know, walking around the kind of these areas of London where Humphrey and I are purportedly sitting right now, we're not actually in front of Buckingham Palace, and that it is you know, really crowded. So. I think a lot of people from overseas are very excited about this. I don't know how much Brits are compared to earlier royal occasions. And I think that what they really have to do is win over those people who are wavering. I also think it will be interesting to see what happens with the Commonwealth, because yes. with this huge new era for the British monarchy, um, particularly in this kind of um, post-Brexit era, I think the world has changed a huge amount and I wonder how many other countries that are affiliated to the UK via the Commonwealth will see a change now that we don't have Queen Elizabeth. I, I noted that, Dan, so I won't be contradicting you initially because I wrote the Commonwealth and encroaching republicanism, which yeah. I think is because there's a, a few Caribbean nations particularly uh, that have already said, and Barbados has already done it, and others that are going to follow it. I think Belize was saying it yesterday that they're going to... To, to, to separate that off. But also with that republicanism comes the history of the British Empire. And I think that is going to affect the Commonwealth quite dramatically because this is the thing about slavery and all that thing is going to keep coming in. I think that's a big challenge. I also noted down to Rachel's question, Harry and Meghan, they mm. are not going to go away as a challenge. And I think that uh, the, 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 Prince Andrew, and these are two serious issues that the, the king is going to have to deal with because yes. if it comes to a, a court case with his brother that actually goes to court, yes. that will be huge. But yes. then the royal family weathered that with, not that it was a court case, but the huge scandal with Edward and Mrs. Simpson um, and managed to weather that. So it depends. There is a lot of love for the royal family, but I, I think things have changed quite a lot in the last few years. Yes, There's I, an interesting I, I, comment I, I, here from Sue. She says, I spoke to my sister in Canada today. She said there didn't seem to be much interest there in Toronto. That's really interesting, Sue, because Canada always seems to be very, very pro-monarchy. So that's quite fascinating. On the other side of the coin, I have a friend who's staying with me this weekend from New Zealand, um, and she's extremely excited about it. So, Yes, I, I think it, it does. Um... I've got a note down here, um, Commonwealth Republican and Harry Meghan, Camilla's exceptions that we've discussed, but I've also noted, love your views on this, King Charles's personal passions. Um, and we know that he, rather than sitting on the fence instinctively like his mother did, he does have these passions and this way of trying to get his way and his thoughts over. And how, how much might that change i'm not saying damage change yeah. the, the status of the royal family well he has already had to be reined in hasn't he um yes. he wasn't allowed to go to the climate summit and those kind of things i personally really like that i you know maybe because i agree with a lot of his views about things like the environment and climate change i want him personally i want him to be a part of that but of course he's not allowed to be um i think he will probably the change will be that he will have to be reined in but of course who reigns him in well, they're, they're protocol people, they really do. And um, the thing is that before, I think, when he couldn't go to the climate change conference, I believe it was, it was either William or Harry who went. And I just thought, well, maybe that's what he does. He's, you know, he pays lip service and says, okay, I'm the monarch, but somebody else in the family goes and makes sure it happens. I don't know. Yes, I think I, one would kind of hope that. Yes. Well, I would. Other people might think it's appalling because he's not allowed to be political, but I guess, and if I didn't agree with his political views on this, <laughs> I'd probably be furious. So it's a very difficult thing to be unbiased about the environment. 
Uh, what have Patrick asked, what happens here? Does granting Camilla full queenship mean in the event of Charles's demise, we will have a reign of Camilla only? Uh, no, Patrick, she's queen consort, definitely. Just as Prince Albert was prince consort and, um, and Prince Philip was prince consort um, and people like Queen Alexandra and uh, Queen Mary, they were, they were queen consorts. They are not ever going to reign under their own steam. Um, if anything happens to Charles, uh, it will at the moment be William. So definitely would never be Queen Camilla. She's, no, she wouldn't be the she Queen. wouldn't be the king mother. She'd be the king's stepmother, technically, would she? Yes, that would be very interesting. I mean, that definitely must have happened in history before when people have been widowed. But yes, she'd be yes, yes Queen Camilla, the yes, the the king's stepmother. Yes, that's a very interesting thought, Humphrey. I've not thought of that before. Well, it just crossed my mind as a, a Jane and Tony ask here, are there any symbols of regalia associated with the coronation ceremony? And I have one. And because I am sitting on one from the last. Yes, time. I was going to say, Humphrey, haven't you actually got something related I, to the last coronation? Do I show got, If you would excuse me moving my microphone for a second, I'll see if this works. And this is the Look at coronation that. chair from Queen Elizabeth II coronation. So I'm fascinated it, by this. You know, there's a number on it there. Huh. And that is the number of the person that sat in that chair, which was one of who was one of my uncles. And apparently, and if anybody can help us on this one, at that coronation, if you went, you were given the chair, which is how I've got it now. And I happen to be sitting on it for this show. And how come he was there? He was there because he he was um, part of my family. You know how families are here and there and everywhere. Part of my family was very close to the royal family um leading up to um well up to in, up to the 50s and all that sort of thing i won't i'm not going to name them but uh, they, they were very close and um all sort of in that coterie of people so he was one of the ones that was invited to the mind you i think they had eight thousand at that one so coronation so it wasn't that <laughs> it wasn't like the two thousand here but I've had this love the image that... of everyone going home with their chairs. You know, you get on the tube in your <laughs> well, just... full coronation dress, holding a chair <laughs> over your shoulder. <laughs> now, I think it was sent to you, uh, or it was sent to him, and then it got he died. It got passed to my mother when she died. It, 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 I, I'm now sitting on it. <laughs> and is it comfortable? Can you imagine sitting on it for eight hours or however long they had to sit? For? Uh, I I just tried. To, I think that our um, our sort of ergonomics of chairs has improved since that. So that's one piece of protocol that's improved <laughs> from seventy years. It it is. I can sit on it for a, a beautiful hour talking to all you wonderful people. <laughs> but I think much longer than that, I might be stretching my back a bit. <laughs> and I wonder how comfortable the chairs will be this time. Will they be historic chairs? Will they be wooden pew? I don't know. Well, I'm so, just thinking if they've got 2,000 yeah. filling the abbey, where did those other 6,000 go? Yeah. Queen Elizabeth's coronation. I guess everybody's going to have a lot of space to stretch out. And maybe they've all got gaming chairs now. So they can just. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And they, they just open the sticks and. and uh, <laughs> but. But yes, to, to answer Joan, uh, Jane and Tony's uh, thing, there are a string of, um, of uh, symbols that are attached to the crown jewels that are being bought in, uh, will be bought in in the procession tomorrow by various designated people that are heads of faith that are that that are that, that are sort of tasked with doing this, like scepters and the crown itself and jewelries and. Um, and they all then go back to the Tower of London, I think, where they're kept um, until the next time. Um, some of the things I've got lists of down here. In fact, this is interesting. There have been 38 coronations at Westminster Abbey, including, as I mentioned earlier, William the Conqueror in 1066. Um, and 39 monarchs have been crowned there. I'm not sure why we've got one extra in, in that thing. <laughs> And I'm not sure whether this happens, but following the oath, the monarch sits in the coronation chair, which was made for King Edward I in 1300. Wow. And the wonderful. coronation regalia that form part of the ceremony, they are sacred objects which represent the powers and responsibilities of the monarch and are presented to the new king and queen during the service. Um, and there's the anointed... Um, the, the oil that is anointed that is the link between the monarch and God, 
uh, and there's all sorts of controversy about that. Um, but the spoon, and again, I'm not sure if it's being used tomorrow with holy oils contained in an ampoule. And the coronation spoon is apparently the most ancient item of coronation regalia. And apparently it is being used tomorrow. My favorite things, when I looked it up, were the three swords, swords of temporal justice, spiritual justice, and mercy. And it says that the practice of carrying them, they're supposed to represent kingly virtues. That began with the coronation in 1189 of Richard the Lionheart. Oh, 1189 Richard the Lionheart, that's it, yes. The Whether they're the same swords. I think a sovereign the sword, a gold globe topped by a cross, as well as a ring and two scepters. And I'm told that our wonderful Rosie has arrived and she knows much more about this than the yes. Rosie. Rosie, are you with us? Hello, I am. Hello. Can you, me? Can you see me? We can, yes. yes. How lovely to see you. Well, apologies, <laughs> everyone. I just tumbled in off a train, so I probably look <laughs> far from regal. You look a train or a royal coach, Rosie? <laughs> Rosie, tell well, us. The train probably had better suspension, I might say, than, than the state golden carriage. <laughs> Are you going to the coronation tomorrow, Rosie? I'm not one of the 2,000, but I am going to the uh, reception and uh, and concert on Fantastic. the Sunday. So so that is wonderful. But I think uh, I think the coronation itself, we'll all be watching it because. Um, I mean, there are many people like myself who um, say my mother was invited to the last coronation, but were not included because uh, our King Charles is very keen uh, to, to enhance his vision in the eyes of everyone about a, a modern a modern monarchy and all embracing, you know, so all sorts of people from different ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. And um, I was just uh, eavesdropping in for the last couple of minutes on your and Humphrey's uh, exchange about uh, some of the, uh, I was going to say jewellery, but I don't think you can call it jewellery. <laughs> They're not trinkets either, are they? Do you have any stories about any of this regalia, Rosie? Is there anything that you know or did we get anything wrong? Well, I think there's one thing that is is quite sort of almost amusing, and, and, and that is that Queen Consort, Camilla, as we can call her at the moment till tomorrow, is actually effectively wearing a recycled crown. <laughs> <laughs> so about that. in the interests of sustainability, um, because actually it's it was, I mean, traditionally, will you excuse me one moment, please? Excuse me, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger I'm leave there. A cliffhanger. Oh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to jump in there with a little story about the um, King George VI's coronation because the Queen and Princess Margaret, little girls, obviously, and they there was a there were these golden crowns made for them that were really you know the the thing the little princesses had to wear, and they were so heavy and so painful that um, George the Sixth had realised that his daughters were going to have to wear crowns that weren't as as, as heavy, so they actually had these. You're talking about the recycled crown, Rosie. That actually these were a kind of you know a substitute crown because they just realised that these little girls were not going to be able to sit wearing them all the way through. <laughs> So, so tell us about the recycled crown, please. Yes, and then we can get back to weight. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> normally a queen, and tradition has it that a, a, a queen consort will always have a whole new crown fashioned for her. Right. Um, but obviously King Charles is keen to, to keep uh, with the genuine sort of feeling for the image of sustainability and to a degree frugality, but was keeping all the sort of, you know, the tra tra traditional uh, values. So yeah, this one that Camilla is going to be using is is the one that was used by Mary, the consort of uh, King George, oh, the fifth yeah. for the nineteen eleven coronation, yeah. oh. <laughs> and um, and also uh, King Charles uh, is. Um, is wearing the, as you said, the solid gold frame uh, St. Edward's crown. The, the, but it's not the original one because the um, spoil sport parliamentarians melted that down uh, after the execution of King Charles the, the, the first. But is, is, isn't everything recycled, Rosie? I mean, everything's been worn or used in coronations before? Uh, to a degree, not 
obviously not the not the oil the anointment <laughs> <laughs> um uh but a, a, no a lot of a lot of the substance will have been recycled yes were you thinking of something in particular um, no, but I wanted to ask you Trisha's question here, because it's a bit of a cheat asking you, actually, but I'm going to do it all the same. Um, have you uh, ever met a member of the royal family? Yes, I have, indeed. Tell us. Yes. Tell us about who you know and when you've met them. Well, um, I, I knew quite well uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Uh, she, she was the, uh, well, she was my great aunt on my uh, maternal side. And therefore I also um, had the honor uh, to have known our Queen Elizabeth II and uh, Prince, uh, although he always rather frightened me because he thought I was mad. <laughs> Dear. <laughs> I want to tell us the origin of that now, Rosie. Just to work his bushy eyebrows and say, what you up to? What you up to now? Barking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then and then the rest of the family. And um and probably uh maybe see the most of of um Prince Edward and so because because they're my age group. Simple as that. Oh yes, yes. Yes. Lucinda, who have you yes. met? I, I met um, Queen Elizabeth and, and Prince Philip and it was a really it was at the Dickens Bicentenary in 2012. And we were there was a the party at Buckingham Palace for to celebrate the Dickens Bicentenary. So it was all sorts of wonderful people who'd been who'd um, ever been in kind of Dickens adaptations, who'd written Dickens adaptations, who'd written books. It was an amazing evening. And then at one point we were taken off to the side and there were 10 family members there and I happened to be the youngest of the family members there. So the Queen was introduced to all of us and I was at the end. I think my father was, was the eldest or one of the eldest and then I was at the other end. So when she got to me, she had time to chat, which was lovely. And um, she was with, my cousin was introducing us and she asked me about Charles Dickens and Queen Victoria. She'd read my Dickens book, which was astonishing whether she had or whether someone had told her but it was very lovely that she told me she had read it and I was actually working on Princess and Louise she read it she probably, she probably had it she was so <laughs> lovely I have to say I became a huge fan after this and um I was working on Princess Louise which I didn't dare admit at the time because yeah. <laughs> it was so controversial but she was asking me about Queen Victoria and Charles Dickens and what happened was he did a performance on stage of a play called The Frozen Deep, which he and Wilkie Collins wrote together. It was a benefit to raise money for the family of a friend of theirs who died, Douglas Gerald, the playwright. And Dickens was all dressed up in his, it was about, it was actually, Rosie, it was about um, exploration. It was about explorers, two explorers who were in love with the same woman and one who sacrificed himself so that the, because he knew that the woman was in love with the other one and allowed the other one to live. And he kind of went off into the, it was the Arctic or Antarctic and died. Um, so he'd performed this and the Queen had requested a royal gala performance. So the royal family was there and the Queen then sent a note to Charles Dickens saying that she you know, would be happy to meet him. And he sent back a very polite note saying, you know, I, I won't meet the Queen in my acting clothes. So she just thought he was being very humble and sent one back you know, saying the Queen does not mind. And Dickens sent one back saying, uh, no, I, Dickens does. <laughs> I won't meet the Queen in my acting clothes. And um, so I was repeating this story and Queen Elizabeth II, she was listening, she was absolutely lovely. And then she just leant forward and she laughed and she said, I think he must have been a very brave man. And I think we <laughs> were under no illusions at all about Queen Victoria. <laughs> he has this kind of, you know, hagiography about Queen Victoria. And when I was researching Princess Louise, I realised I didn't like him. She oh, that's was very horrible as a mother, and I loved the fact that Queen Elizabeth II totally understood how scary she was, yeah. um, and I just I thought that was really lovely. And and Prince Philip just did the and what do you do, you know, but very friendly. I didn't really chat to him, but ever since then I've just been a staunch fan of the Queen. I thought she was amazing. And when I wrote Elizabeth Revealed, uh, it took a while. I was wondering why the editors hadn't got back to me, and then they said to me, "Oh, we didn't want to let you know, but the Queen's private secretary requested to read it, and um, and by the way, he loved it, and he hasn't made any changes." I was, oh my god they didn't tell me because that would have really freaked me out after my princess louise experience 
<laughs> it wasn't the royal family it was the the royal collection the royal archives who were very snotty about that um i thought oh gosh i'm going to be vetoed i'm going to be you know well, i don't know it sounds like you're getting very well known in those circles <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll let them know you're in good form <laughs> thank you yeah. you have to have, have to get into those archives anybody's got any comments to make we are we, you know you can unmute yourself and just uh Put a hand up and uh, and say anything you want, and we'll deal with it, or you deal with us. One of one of the ways around. We have another question. Well, I want to just say, has anybody here got an experience of meeting a royal family member? Yes. Let us know. And Humphrey, we need to know about you. Yes, yes I've met uh, King Charles. Um, In uh, what Princess, context? Uh, twice he did was at the Hong Kong handover. Or oh, no, he you know before the Hong Kong handover, he was there, and then somewhere in London at a thing, and the Queen at a garden party. In <laughs> somewhere in London, else. I didn't really meet her at the somewhere else, but the garden party, you line up, and she comes, and and you do that. And Prince Philip came to a celebration of the Queen's ninetieth. I think he was the patron of the Travellers Club, and we That's we had right. dinner, dinner there for him. And Sophie um, and Edward, Sophie is the, the 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 top patron of a charity and um, Trelaw Trust that I'm a patron of. So I've met her two or three times giving talks and that um, with with that. I think that's it. I haven't met the younger generation at all. They talk. You have to go to Annabelle's nightclub to find them, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's that nightclub anymore. <laughs> 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 am, am, am I out of fashion, Rosie? <laughs> I think you are, yeah. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, and now, this is an, what is the protocol for seating arrangements during the coronation? Which now, I Rosie, do you know this? Find. Well, I do, I have no idea except that I I gather that bar the very front rows, as it were, people aren't actually allocated uh seat numbers as it were it's more to do with the row or the pew that you're you're in again yeah. another sort of more sort of equal uh approach yes i think there was some uh, reshuffle after dominic raab uh, resigned uh, because he would have come in and then apparently he's lord chancellor which is the oldest cabinet position in the country and nobody was quite sure what was happening there but I think it's, you know, you walk in and you're told where you're going to sit. Yes, they're, you, they're you probably are. still juggling it about now, aren't they? Well, well imagine uh, anyone who's ever organised a wedding. Imagine what this is like. 2,000 people. I know. Well, at least it's it's not the same number as, as the 8,000 that Queen Elizabeth had. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> And I, I don't know, it's, it's interesting how they'll sort of um, section them because at uh, Queen Elizabeth's funeral, uh, they had, for instance, in, in on one side of the, the choir uh, stalls, um, uh, they had all the prime ministers, the British prime ministers. So it was a bit like looking... <laughs> King at Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> I don't. I don't think. Do you know what, Rosie? I don't think there's enough space in Westminster Abbey for all the prime we've had in the last year. So I think that's going to have to change. <laughs> the other thing that's actually changing about the service is that because I was I was talking to somebody who is going, and they were saying, "Lord, you know, they they have to turn up at eight thirty a.m. or whatever it is, and and then the service doesn't." Uh, as you know, start till 11. So there's a question of, you know, time, how do you say it, etc. Um, <laughs> so it, it's a long time, but the service itself, uh, the, the last coronation, I think, was over three hours. Yes. And uh, it's just the it's just the hour this time. Yeah. And the, 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 profession, the processional distance is shorter. Think, there's there's well. a question from Lillette on Facebook, which I think morphs into some issues that have been on the on you know been discussed over the past few days i live in edinburgh now these celebrations these occasions subdued compared to when we lived in london i'm a bit worried the neighbors will take offense if i display my coronation flags well, and of course we've had this controversy and debate about standing up and swearing allegiance during the the, the coronation which jonathan dimbleby um who's a friend of king charles went on the radio this morning to say that King Charles did not ask for that to happen, and that was the Archbishop of Canterbury. So there seems to be all this sort of uh, toing and froing, almost divisiveness over the coronation and the monarchy. 
I thought it was a very strange thing asking people to swear allegiance. It doesn't seem like the kind it, of thing. It doesn't. It doesn't, do it doesn't smack of King Charles. I I have to say, um, but as 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 for uh, putting out your flag or whatever it is up in Edinburgh, you must you must go by your principles. And if you want to, you know, support the coronation and the monarchy, then you should do so. And you should be proud to do so. And and maybe by doing that, other people will put out their flags bunting too. Yes, yes. Lucinda, any thoughts on that? Um, I just I just think it's sad that the country has become so divisive that people are worried about things like this. I mean, you know, surely if, if they don't want to watch the coronation, surely they wouldn't be abusive to you, one would hope. Um, it just seems very sad that people feel now that they can police other people's behaviour over things like this. And I think people have become very, very scared of doing anything. Um, I, I remember with the clapping for carers in the pandemic, I didn't want to do it because I actually got the first week, I thought it was a good idea. And after that, I just felt really infuriated that they were being clapped for and not given any more money. And I felt very belligerent about it. And um, and I did get made to feel like I was being awful because I wasn't out there clapping every week. So I do know, I do know what you're talking about there. Uh, whereas I, and I, as Rosie said, it was my principle. I thought, do you know what? This is appalling that they're not being paid. So um, yeah, but there is a pressure. I totally agree. Pressure, and we should be able to do whatever we want as long Absolutely. as it, you did fly a flag or, or not. Like, uh, Sandy's got a, an interesting one here before we go on to our next big question. Uh, my husband was a farmer tenant of the Queen, and I saw the Queen and Philip at tenants' events in Lancashire. Shocked at how short the Queen was. Rosie? <laughs> <laughs> Despite her, her height, she actually exuded an immense uh, presence. Mm. And, I mean, she could uh, come into a crowded room and you'd instantly know that there was someone very special in the room. She she just had an she had an aura about her, which um, can cannot be denied. I mean, it's not a figment of the imagination. So I don't think her stature really counted for anything at the end of the day. Does anybody know how tall she was? Oh, um, uh, well, I can't well, it depends at what I was age. About of five foot when I met her, but um, <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm five foot three. I did have heels on, but I remember one of the rarest. Yes, things in my life when I felt five foot one or two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember a lovely story that one of my mum's friends told me once who was she was at a dog show in Windsor Great Park and it was pouring with rain and everybody was you know there in their barbers and things and she got chatting to um the, 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 she had her friend staying with her and her friend got chatting to a woman who you know was there looking at the dogs as well and they talked about their dogs and they you know had a, had a nice chat and my mum's friend was just standing there going oh! and anyway eventually after this woman left my mum's friend's friend turned to her and said, oh, what a nice woman. And my mum's friend said, you do know who you were just talking to? She said, oh, no, I didn't ask her name. And she said, that was the Queen. And she was just oh. dressed in a headscarf and a barber, <laughs> just having a nice, wandering around, having a nice chat about dogs. And um, But this woman hadn't realised at all. And I just thought that was so sweet. So she could go very much incognito when she wanted to. And it must have been yeah. lovely on the occasions when people didn't realise who she was to just be able to, you know, have a nice chat about dogs. Everybody there would have been in the same mindset as she was. So I just thought that As was... did Prince Philip too. Do you remember we talked about this? Because he used to uh, enjoy uh, driving around London unrecognised in his black London taxi. And he used to wear a Mac and a, a cloth cap. <laughs> yeah. He's a driver. Even for my bought one <laughs> as well. Whether he get his light on or not, I don't know. <laughs> Fry, I remember always saying he bought one because he said it was the only way you could drive like an idiot in London and get away with it. And I always remember hearing an interview with him where Stephen Fry said that somebody once got in the back of his cab and he didn't have a light on or anything and he just asked to go somewhere and he just drove him because he thought, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Prince Philip might have done that at some point as well. Really you could funny. have had a very erudite conversation with your cab driver in that. <laughs> Absolutely. Changed the opinion of cab drivers forever. <laughs> um, we have, uh, it, it, actually, we have a dovetail of questions here. We have uh, a question for, I'm not sure it's from, that it came in from somewhere. What impact is the coronation expected to have on the country or region where it is taking place? And Paula asks, I think this is coming in from our Facebook feed, do you think people are right to call an end to the monarchy? We need occasions like this to bring the country together and lift spirits. So I think that's the sort of same sort of theme there. Um, yes. 
Rosie? I think that there, that there, is, there is so much transience about our lives now, whether it's uh, the, the politicians and the unknown about the environment, this, that, the other, that it's even, I mean, personally speaking, I think it's even more precious that we have this, this rich seam of continuity. Um, and yes, um, admittedly, it has to adapt and uh, evolve with the times, but that's precisely what it's doing, but but suitably gradually. I think when uh, people talk about Republicans and you know Republican countries, I just think, well, would I rather be in somewhere like America, where if you don't have a royal family, you replace them with someone like the Trumps or the Kennedys. I mean, it's yes. uh, there's always exactly. like, the Kardashians. Um, I lived in Austria for a while, and in Austria, they are very proud of the fact that they don't have a royal family. And everyone used, I was a teenager, and they used to say, oh, you're so, so backward having a royal family. But what I discovered in Vienna was that everything is about money and education. And that they have an absolute hierarchy. And I think, well, every single society has that. Um, I, I think the, uh, what of them are fierce snobs and they all aspire to royalty anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, 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 yeah, I mean, look, 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 look at France. But, but I think, I mean, I've worked as, a, you know, as a correspondent in, in those countries that have monarchies like Thailand, Jordan, even Saudi Arabia, as much as we criticize it. Those monarchies, and a bit like us, are the glue that hold the country together in times of trouble or crisis and that sort of thing. And because we don't have a written constitution, unlike in the US, for example, I think what we're going to see tomorrow is a sort of visual display of what the country is, what it represents, the values that we have. In other words, a sort of visual constitution will be presented to us. I don't know. If anybody thinks I'm nuts in thinking that? Well, I think it's a really interesting concept. I love the fact that, you know, comparing it to other other countries around the world. I mean, I've, I've, I think it's really fascinating. Yeah. I'm gonna yes, I, I agree. And I think that actually, um, whatever other countries and, and uh, nationalities criticize us for, they do actually uh, rather admire and enjoy our state occasions as well. And almost, dare I say, it, envy it. Yes. The, the... Most Americans I know are m far more excited about this coronation than most of my British friends. Um, they are <laughs> very, very excited. And, uh, you know, there have been people booking to come over for the coronation. And I think one thing that thankfully, seeing as the British economy is in such a bad state at the moment, that hopefully tourism is absolutely booming this weekend. I really hope so, because the hoteliers and people desperately need this injection of tourism. You know, it's been so difficult the last couple of years. So I hope that it has a really good knock on effect as well. Mm -hmm. um, Lee on Facebook says, I worked on a royal wedding years ago and met the Queen and Queen Mother. We were at Clarence House, such a wonderful experience. And Sandis, uh, I cried when Prince Philip passed away and earlier um, uh, there was the, the message corroborating this presence that the Queen had when she walked into a room. And I've, I've experienced that. Everybody knows, yeah. uh, even mm. though she might only be this high. <laughs> mm. Mm. She had it since she was a little girl, interestingly. My mother used to describe it. Yeah, fascinating. Yes. Uh, yes. It, it's, um, and, and Rosie, in your travels from the... Aral Sea to the North Pole through the Sinai <laughs> Desert and that. Is there a, um, you know, is there a, an awareness of the royal family or the monarchy? Because, you know, you've been to the most wayward places, haven't you? Yes, there's very much an awareness. I'm, 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 I'm actually astounded sometimes in some of the remoter areas, um, certainly on the, the Sinai and the Bedouin, they were all completely in awe and wonder about uh, monarchy. Oh. Um, yeah, definitely. And obviously in Kazakhstan with the Aral, uh, we have a very good relationship. Anglo-Kazakh relations are strong. Yeah. So uh, there's a great mutual respect there too. Interesting. I, yeah. never, I never asked an Inuit about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. No, it's, it's, um, this other question, what role do religious leaders or institutions play in the coronation ceremony? Rosie? Well, which religious leaders are you actually talking about? Because it's, it's um, I mean, 
our king is very keen, as we all know, to embrace um, all faiths or to be seen to embrace all faiths. And even that to the degree of not losing its intrinsic meaning and value, but to evolve with that in the sense that the, the actual, um, the anointment itself, which still can't be seen by us, not because of its original uh, reasons, which was divine right, etc., but still to uphold and respect the sense of sanctity. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the, 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 the anointment is, um, I mean, it dates back to the Old Testament, doesn't it? It does. Yes. It does. Well, can you explain? But it's, well, it's a bridge between uh, not being anointed because in the Old Testament times, it was a, it, you were anointed directly by God. And that's what divine right is all about. Uh, whereas uh, in King Charles's instance, tomorrow, it confirms him as the supreme governor of the Church of England. And he, he along with that, is obviously keen to be seen as a defender of, of the faiths, plural, as well. And he has got invited, um, he's invited leaders representing Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Sikh, Sikhism, which I think is, as you said, really inclusive. I think that's a very important thing in our country. Well, seeing that it was the Sikhs yeah. who once held possession of, of the controversial Koi Noor diamond, oh, yeah. that's probably right. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that'll Wasn't be a... the, the line of Punjab, yeah. who actually had it at one stage. Uh... And I, 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 I really like the fact that this coronation is going to be inclusive. I think it really needs to be to embrace a modern Britain. And for me, that's a really, really important thing. Um, we, we were talking earlier, weren't we, Lucinda, about the changing protocols yeah. uh, that there was in that in that uh, King Charles can now marry Camilla, and 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 that couldn't have happened yeah. before, and all of this stuff, and and um, Wallace and Edward and, and that sort of thing. What what protocols are changing now? What sort of benchmarks does this coronation show for changing protocols? Would would you constitutionally? Say? Nothing really, or not very much. I mean, uh, so Camilla will be known as Queen Camilla, uh, following the king's wishes uh, after the coronation, but uh, it doesn't affect um, her position in, in the constitutional context. In that she she won't have um, access to to constitutional papers. Uh, documents, etc., or uh, constitutional duties, uh, which fall on the lap of the king. So she is there uh, as consort to the monarch, mm. helping to support by way of performing and joining in with public duties, etc. Yeah, I, I want to just say something a little bit about the oil we talked about earlier, because I remember when I wrote my book on on Queen Elizabeth II. It was a fascinating thing about the oil with which they will be anointed because it was used for decades and decades i mean hundreds of years but then when the queen was crowned there had to be a new batch because the previous vial of oil which had been kind of almost a bit like a i don't know like a sourdough starter had been kind of kept going it had the been mother <laughs> had been, yeah the mother it had been hit by a direct bomb in the second world war um in when the deanery of westminster abbey was hit by a bomb and i said this is a, a kind of the this is only the second time this particular oil is going to have been used for a coronation and i think that's quite special that this will you know that there's a, like a piece of it that will be used to create the new coronation oil i think that's really fascinating yes it's a lovely symbol of continuity yeah. Yes. Do, do we know what type, where the oil comes from? Is it palm oil, olive oil? Palm oil? oil? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Those orangutans need to be saved. <laughs> That's the world we used to work for Shell, did so I can be... tell you, though, there is one very controversial ingredient. It's oils of roses, oranges, musk, cinnamon, and ambergris. I mean, ambergris is, is found naturally. You don't have to kill a whale to get ambergris. But, um, yes, it's... It's that it's a combination of all of those things, apparently, unless they've changed it since Queen Elizabeth II. But that is what the oil that she was anointed was made from. One wonders what it smells like. One yes. hopes it smells lovely. Because you're under a clock, you're under a thing, aren't you? So you're under a thing, yes. <laughs> and it's, it's head, breast, you know, it's yes. 
And you can't go and buy it in boots, can you? Or is some I don't think so, but you know, I mean, it up. probably one of the Kardashians will produce it at some point, or you know, <laughs> someone who's been on, or you know, I'm a celebrity will suddenly create a you know, an anointing what, or... and launch their own perfume yeah. brand with it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple more questions that have come in, and I think we've covered them, but I'll I'll read them out anyway because they, they they what is the historical significance of coronations in this region or country? The so, historical, yes, to Edward goes back a thousand years, doesn't it? Goes goes back to well, when was King Edward on the throne? Nine something. Yes. Well, uh, will it be after um, William the Conqueror? So yeah, no, uh, yes, William the Conqueror was crown. Was, was cor- Seven eighties, I think. So, yeah, Edward. Westminster Abbey. Yes. Yeah. So it was before that. I mean, it's quite amazing to think that something that has been happening for so many hundreds of years is still being done. Yes. To me, as a historian, well, that's so you're, valuable. You're, I mean, all I know, I'm afraid I can't answer that, but I do know that the the the, the spoon that you were talking about earlier, the lovely pearl encrusted mm. special spoon, I mean, that's 700 years old. Yes, yes. And yeah. that's not the oldest part of it. There's something given the, you know, people say we're living in turbulent times or whatever, but given the continuity that we're going to be showing the world tomorrow, uh, with what we've been to the spoon, the Westminster Abbey, William the Conqueror, and all of that that stuff, is it how settling a, do you think it is in sort of psychology of people that you can have this continuity? Very reassuring. It yeah. gives you an anchor point, doesn't it? Yes, because we. I, did, I mean, you know, we did bring back the monarch, didn't we, after mm-hmm. Cromwell, because that didn't work. Exactly. Oh, life is very boring under the Puritans. The French didn't bring back their monarch. Yeah, Yeah, I I think because we had the Puritans and they were so boring, they banned dancing and theatre and everything fun. and Yes, they banned Morris dancing and and mince pies. I mean, mince pies were blasphemous. I mean, who wants that? (laughs) No fun at all. Just without mince pies and dancing, you know. Exactly. So that, you know, that's why if they, if they hadn't gone in with that approach, if they'd gone in and said, you can still do all the fun stuff, who knows, we may have been like France, but they really went about it the wrong way if they wanted to, you know, they stopped. People that's that's a really good point, because because what we're showing tomorrow is, you know, it's going to be brilliant, but it's also fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Well, well I, now I it's full of start. fun people now. I read mm. an article where that, where that we are the last country in Europe that still has coronations. Um, I don't know. Um, I literally don't know whether that's true. I'm trying was trying to think of another. I thought Denmark, presumably, they have their royal family. I don't know. Maybe they don't have a coronation in the way. Well, that they we have royal do. families throughout Scandinavia. Perhaps they don't have a well, coronation. Norway, we do. Yeah, Norway, they've got them. But yeah. they, but explain the the, the difficulties because because Charles became king on the Queen's death. Um, the, the royal standard is is um, you know, long live the king. Um, but then, so the coronation is what? It's not making him king. What is it? It elevates. It's reaffirming. It's, it's reaffirming, it's, again, isn't it? It's, again, it's a, the, the, the actual anointing as well. Yes, the oil again. The oil again, yes. <laughs> yeah. Edward the and eighth. it's doing so in, in the eyes of the, um, of the country. And, and yes. Edward VIII, is he... I thought he was not properly considered king because he was never actually crowned. He was a kind of king before he abdicated, but it wasn't it wasn't a kind of full status if, king. If he had if he had gone through with the coronation, he would not have been able to abdicate. No. Yeah. So he became king, but he was able to resign and go and live in France because he hadn't had the coronation. Mm. Yep. Wasn't anointed. Yeah. 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 So- so, and what a lucky escape we had. So how are you going to celebrate the next few days, given your links and your views and everything on all this? <laughs> Rosie will be at the concert. Uh, I'll be at the concert, but tomorrow I, uh, we're going to uh, walk to a friend's house uh, that overlooks St. James's Park and uh, join her there to, to look at everyone enjoying it and to, to watch the actual service on television, of course. Oh, and, um, and then obviously have suitable victuals afterwards. 
yeah. and then on yes on sunday it'll be um a reception at windsor and the uh, concert and of course uh, <laughs> the modern dilemma for everyone is well what should a girl wear on such an important occasion oh, but yeah. it's a pop concert essentially <laughs> well uh, you, you, shoes you, you can do your explorer right? outfit yeah <laughs> 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 it's quite yeah, I think it's 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 quite warm now so I, I'm gonna wear sort of satin trousers and hope that it, that they don't meet a frosty reception <laughs> Jesus, like so, so, so glad you're back safely after your trek Rosie yeah. sorry Lucinda I was just gonna say make sure you wear shoes you can dance in and walk in because it's you know <laughs> it's not going to be easy trying to wear something really smart to that gig and then dancing you don't want to do that no, well, I, I, I'm not so sure that there will be much uh, dancing or shimmying, actually. It might be sitting and listening, I hope. <laughs> uh, Lu Lucinda, Amber wants you, and Amber's obviously going to sell her product to Boots, as I suggested. Lucinda, could you repeat the ingredients of the anointing oil, please? Is there any olive oil as well? No, oils of roses, oranges, musk, cinnamon and ambergris. Allegedly. Now, that was what Queen Elizabeth II had. Um, I assume that is a very, very old recipe, but I don't know. You might have to get onto Westminster Abbey to find out what they've done. <laughs> We've probably got somebody who's got an actual job title of, you know, the royal oil anointer expert. You know, the, the kind of job that you only have to do once in a 70 year career but you need to be there just in case all the alchemists out there are going to be <laughs> and ben has asked as well make wearing, sure wearing what, what, what everybody's plans are this weekend but make sure to join us on sunday join us being goldster not actually the three of us um for the post coronation street party at 5 p.m on goldster so everybody who's watching this today do remember that um there will be a 5 p.m post coronation street party online street party on and, gold so don't feel that you have to miss out and in edinburgh if nobody else is letting you put your bunting out you can come on to goldster yes lots Geeta of bunting and huge flags sorry <laughs> i just said say Geeta missed the show looking forward to it all day she got carried away shopping <laughs> so you just tuned in is there a recording of it i don't know if there's a recording of it is there a recording of it then <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope not actually I'm really hoping it wasn't recorded sorry Gita <laughs> I like both your backgrounds by the way I think everyone oh, well, yeah. as you can tell we're, we're sitting outside yes <laughs> and we're going in for reception afterwards aren't yeah. we uh, yeah we're just, we're just, we're just <laughs> heading in yeah. we, I, I unwittingly matched the flowers so I'm quite pleased about that <laughs> Yes, I'm afraid my floral contribution is a bit more modest. <laughs> now, now we are out of time. I want last thoughts from you, Lucinda, on the coronation. Uh, I just hope everybody enjoys it. I think it is really nice to have something after a miserable few years to actually celebrate and enjoy. And if you don't want to enjoy it, happily don't enjoy it. And if you do, do and don't give anyone else food. Really. And, and Rosie, your thoughts, your final thoughts. I think that this is going to be remembered as a remarkable occasion in all our lives, not one that everyone always has in their lives. So make the most of it, enjoy it, and, and uh, come out on the streets, wave your flags, get your bunting out, and join in with the, all the fun and support your crown and country. An incredible moment in history. Amazing <laughs> moment in history that we're living through. Phenomenal. <laughs> it is it is phenomenal. we are out of time but we will be back on sunday not us uh, but um lee i think is going to be back for the post coronation street party at 5 p.m on goal so tune into that but rosie stanza thank you lucinda hawksley thank you uh, what a great conversation we've had <laughs> and humphrey thank you oh. thank you humphrey <laughs> and good to see can you i show you my coronation chair again <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.